In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, a man had a mild heart attack, so he took his wife with him to go see the doctor. <clears throat> and after talking to the man, the doctor takes the man's wife aside in a separate room and tells her that the, her only hope for preventing another, probably fatal, heart attack is to remove all stress from her husband's life. The doctor tells her that the good news is that if she does just a few things, it'll keep him alive. And all she needs to do is to cook three delicious meals for him every day. Keep up with all the housework. Never show him any disrespect and always be available for romance. The wife nods and thanks the doctor. On their way home, the husband asks the wife what the doctor said to her in private. The wife thinks for a moment and tells him, well, the doctor said some confusing things, but the bottom line is, I'm so sorry, you're probably going to die. <laughs> Laying down your life for your mate can be very difficult. But if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, it's normal in the kingdom of God. Open your Bibles, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 5, page 1243 in your Red Pew Bibles. Paul begins his famous passage on marriage in Ephesians 5 with verse 21. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. The original Greek is captured here in the ESV, not so much in most translations, because it's the last clause in the long previous sentence where Paul is describing, starting at verse 18, what it is to be filled with the Spirit. You see, submitting yourself to others is a mark of the Holy Spirit in a person. When the Spirit of God comes to be in charge of your life, he gives you divine power to do all kinds of things that otherwise you could never do. And that includes the power and the will to submit to his divinely ordered separate roles in marriage that God gives to husbands and to wives. I'm borrowing liberally today from Tim and Kathy Keller's marvelous book, The Meaning of Marriage, which I highly recommend. And we're pressing in on a sermon series through Paul's letter to the Ephesians. And now we come to this most controversial part. Today, I'm focusing on wives' roles, as Paul does first. And next week, I'm going to look more at the husband's role. Paul says, verse 22 and 33, that wives are to submit to their husbands and to respect them. Each spouse is called to sacrifice for the other. Both spouses are to submit to one another, but we have somewhat different ways in which we do that, as Paul makes clear. At Romans 15, verses 1 through 3, Paul gives a similar exhortation to all believers when he says, We're not to please ourselves, but instead to please our neighbor, for his own good, for even Christ did not please himself. Right after this passage um, uh, that was just read, that uh, Adele just read, Paul goes on in Ephesians chapter 6 to discuss the need of children to obey their parents and employees and bond servants to obey their employers and masters. You see, respecting authority and submitting to others are part of the normal Christian life. Since the Bible is a word from God and not from men or women, we should expect it to challenge us, even to disturb us from time to time. I want to say that if when you read the Bible, it doesn't disturb you from time to time, you're probably not reading closely enough. Okay? If we really believe that the Bible is a word from God for all time, cultures and all times that stands above and judges all cultures, then we ought to expect that at some points the Bible is going to contradict our cultural understandings of how we are to live 
the, uh, the Christian life. The commands of the Bible can seem hopelessly regressive, even oppressive, considered from the current cultural categories of sexism, heterosexism, and yes, cisgendered language and hierarchies. Don't get me started. But if we really do believe that the Bible is the word of God, then it's going to challenge our current culture, and this is one of those places. Now, to buttress his points, Paul takes us back to creation. He insists that these gender roles are grounded in the order of creation. Verse 31, take a look at it. Not in changing culture. Going back to Genesis chapters 1 and 2, we see that God created us male and female. And let me just say parenthetically here, you know, there are people today who think that they were born in the wrong body, and they're trying to change their sex. They're called transgender people, right? And some of them have taken on hormone therapy to try to change from man to woman and woman into man. But I want you to know something. At a deep cellular level, there is no possible way to change from being a man or a woman. You are either XX or XY in every single cell of your body. So you can try to change, but you will miss you will miss God's gift that he wants to express through you, even in your tension and your confusion, if you think that, um, that God made a mistake when he made you. Now, when I speak about gender roles in marriage, I want to be clear, I'm not speaking about stereotypes. Like, for example, men pay the bills, Go to work and take out the trash. And women, stay at home with the kids and do the cooking and the cleaning. Now, don't get me wrong, that is a fine and godly arrangement. Ginger and I have had that arrangement for many years. But it's not what biblical gender roles are about. You see, in Bible times, both men and women worked together in or near the home to produce income. And both men and women took care to teach the children and to discipline them. You see, biblical gender roles aren't about modern stereotypes. In the Bible, husbands are called to be leaders who serve. To be a real man, you don't have to like football. You might even like dance or eating quiche. To be a real woman, you don't have to like chatting on the phone. You might like baseball or pumping gas. None of that stuff is in the Bible. In the Bible, wives are called to be responders who serve. I want you to uh, remember with me the Proverbs 31 wife. This is a picture of the ideal wife in the scriptures. And among other things, she's a wheeler dealer. She buys and sells real estate. She deals in cloth. She leads in the marketplace. There's very little specific guidance in the Bible about what husbands and wives are to do. Don't misunderstand me. I'm discussing marriage today. I'm not discussing gender roles in church or society. That's a different topic for a different day. But the Bible does not say that all women are to submit to all men everywhere. Get that? Many times men are properly to submit to women in the workplace and in the church when they're in roles of authority. Look back at Genesis chapter 3 with me. After the fall, God tells Adam, you're going to work and you're going to sweat. And the thorns and thistles are going to interfere. And he tells Eve, you're going to have pain in childbearing. And your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. He tells Adam, in effect, your work will become your idol. So I'm cursing it because your work is never going to give you what you want. For Eve, God curses her relationships. She will become too emotionally dependent on her husband, and he will become a tyrant over her. This rulership of man over woman is not God's original plan. 
It's a result of the curse of the fall. It is not good. Fallen men tend to oppress women, and that has been so from the beginning. Fallen women tend to be victims, overly dependent on their husbands for their emotional and material needs. Historically, much of the church has twisted the teaching about submission in marriage beyond what the Bible commands and reinforced cultural norms that made women and girls little more than chattels of their husbands and fathers. Now, that is an accurate description of gender roles in Bible times. Paul gives us a different prescription here in his letter to the Ephesians. Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, gives us God's remedy. While I, believe, while I do have faithful friends who disagree, and I believe that, that uh, faithful Christians can disagree on this issue, I do not believe that the best biblical remedy is egalitarianism or an erasing of gender roles in marriage. I believe the most biblical remedy is called complementarianism. Men and women equally bear the image of God, but their roles in marriage are different. Look again at verse 22. It says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. The wife, then it jumps down to verse 33, says the wife must respect her husband. Author Jill Briscoe writes, How are wives to submit to their husbands? As to the Lord. How do you submit to the Lord? Willingly, gladly, voluntarily, and with abandon. She says, that's how I submit to the Lord, and it's how I submit to my husband, not because I have to, but because I get to. You see, the submission of the wife to the husband is voluntary. Ephesians 5.22 in, in grammatical terms, is what's known as the middle voice. That means it's voluntary. Husbands are never enjoyed, enjoined to make sure that their wives submit to them. Do you hear me, men? This is something that she must choose to do out of submission to the Lord. She submits to you. Richard Foster says that submission, like all the spiritual disciplines, is intended to bring freedom from sin and bondage. It's, it's not intended to lay heavy burdens on us. You see, when we submit to one another, we lay down the terrible burden of always needing to get our own way. We're set free to value other people's preferences and dreams above our own. Now, submission does not mean that the couple never argues or that the husband always gets his way. Whenever I hear couples tell me, oh, we never argue, I get worried. I'm serious. It's like, what does that mean you don't argue? Do you not have any opinions? Does it mean the husband always gets his way? That is not what Paul is calling um, husbands and wives to do. You see, a godly husband will regularly defer to his wife, listening to her advice and often taking it. I believe that a wife's submission has to do with decision-making when you cannot agree as a couple. Husbands are to love their wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Therefore, the husband does not have the right to use his authority to simply please himself. Now, the egalitarian marriage people say that if you can't agree, you just don't make the decision. But in my experience, that just doesn't always work. What if you can't agree on where to put your kids in school? Are they going to be in public school? Are they going to be in private school? Are they going to be homeschooled? You can't put that decision off forever. You, have, you know, the kids have to be educated. Where are they going to go to school? How do you break the tie? The Bible's answer is to let the husband do it. Why would that be? 
Well, according to Tim Keller, when you let the husband initiate and the wife defers, you're getting in touch with something that God created deep inside of you. You're getting in touch with your masculinity and your femininity. You're getting in in touch with something that's deep and very real. It glorifies God, and it's in accord with your particular modality of humanity. You know, it's not necessarily going to fit what you've been taught in college. It won't necessarily even fit your feelings, but you're going to find that it actually fits the reality of who you are, according to the Bible. When the Bible talks about letting the husband lead, wives, give him the tie-breaking authority. I think that, generally speaking, the, the Christian wives that I know, they long for their husbands to lead. Would you just step up and lead? The problem is that oftentimes they don't lead spiritually. What do you do? Well, we're going to talk uh, about husbands uh, more next time, but basically, wives, what you do is you do what you can do. You can't control your husband's behavior. <laughs> No one can control anyone else's behavior. You can only control your own behavior. So you focus on your duties, and you respect your husband, and you love him, right? And you pray for him. Uh, Let me just say parenthetically, my wife is a strong woman. Uh, I'm so sorry. I can't tell you. Uh, I'm sad that she's not here today. She's in Alabama, okay, visiting her mother, Uh, where she needs to be right now. But I so want her to be here today. She'll be back next week. But is she... She found herself to be the leader in every kind of romantic relationship she had until she met me. And she didn't really want to be the leader. But it wasn't until... uh, It wasn't until... And she led because I fell in love with her first. She led during the initial parts of our courtship. But it wasn't until I realized that, you know, there was something deeply wrong here that wasn't working for me or for her that she let me lead. And, and there was something, there was a deep yes inside of her that I believe m- most women really long for that. They long for their husbands to lead. Verse 33, wives, it says, respect your husbands. One important way you can do this is not to correct him in public. You dishonor God and you dishonor your husband when you do that. Instead, take him aside and privately counsel him on a more excellent way. You see, when you respect your husband, you meet his very deep need for encouragement. Okay, ladies, just get it. Men are weak. We need encouragement, <laughs> okay? This is, this is why, okay? This is why God says, respect your husbands. This is a huge need that men have, and you can provide it for them. You can meet that need by respecting your husband so that he can be the leader that God's called him to be. <clears throat> Ginger is really great at this. From time to time, she even, I mean, I don't know where she gets this, but she even says, oh, Clancy, you're my hero. I am such a sucker, I fall for it every time. <laughs> no, but jokes aside, I mean, there's, it, there's a sense in which she really believes it, and I believe her. Oh, God made it that way. I've heard people say that the husband may be the head of the wife, But the wife is the neck, which turns the head. I think that's funny, but like all jokes that work, there's some truth to it. A married couple is to be one. We work together as a body. You see, couples work this truth out in a variety of ways. There's no one single way to work out this pattern. Let me share with you how Ginger and I work at it. You know, Ginger is wise in many ways that I'm not. She's smart, she's intuitive, and she's opinionated. 
We work hard to resolve differences and to come to agreement before we make decisions. And let me tell you, 99% of the time, we can agree on what to do. In those few times that we can't agree, what we do is we decide to put the decision off and to take some more time to pray about it and come back and look at it again. If we still can't agree and a decision really must be made, well, then uh, we've agreed in advance that, that because God has appointed me head of my household, that I will make the final decision. Now, the scripture says that the husband, as head of the household, is finally responsible before God for his family. In the same way, I am finally responsible before God for your spiritual life. If you, you know, just, just try to wrap your head around that, okay? I hope it makes you pray for me. Okay? But every husband is in that same situation in his own home. He has to answer to God for the spiritual life and the, the, the whole life uh, of the, the family that he's responsible for. Wives, there is freedom for you. There is comfort for you in submitting to your husband even when he's wrong. Once you've made your concern known to your husband and you've respected his role as the head of the home, he is responsible before God for the decisions he makes, and you are not if he's wrong. So focus on your own duties, not your mates. The only behavior you have to control over is your own. A husband is to love, lead, and serve his wife. We're not men. We're not to worry or badger our wives about how they're responding or how they're accomplishing their duties. Similarly, a wife is to respect, submit, and serve her husband and not worry or nag her husband about how he is or is not leading the family or accomplishing his duties. Paul says all of this is a great mystery. Take a look at verse 32. It's a great mystery mystery. It's not a secret that only a few know. That's not what mystery means. It means it's something that has been hidden, but that God is now revealing. Headship, Paul, Paul says it's a picture of Christ and his church. You see, headship and submission to authority, and even falling in love, teaches us about our relationship with Christ. C.S. Lewis said this, and I believe it to be true, that we're all feminine in relation to Christ. If we are the bride of Christ, he is our husband, whether we're men or women. You see, he leads and we follow. Take a look at verse 31. See, it says, is quoting uh, Genesis, where a man leaves his mother and father and cleaves to his wife. This is a radical picture. This is a crazy picture of how much God loves you. He loves you with as much passion as a bridegroom loves his bride. He glories in his relationship with you. You see, we submit willingly and gladly to Christ's love for us. He wants to be with you forever, even though he knows all your flaws. And I can tell you, on your wedding night, probably, uh, highly likely, you did not know all the flaws about your future husband or wife. But God knows all about you, and he wants to be with you anyway. Our marriages that have lasted many years are a picture of Christ's devotion to us, even though he knows all about us. You see, Christ didn't die for an idea. He died for you. He lives for you like a good husband lives for his wife. If you're single, you may be thinking this morning, well, if only I had a great marriage, I'd be complete. No, the best marriage is never enough. Only Christ can complete you. He is the ultimate head. He is the ultimate helper. He loves you. 
He died for you. He lives for you. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this picture that you've given us in marriage of Christ's relationship to the church. Lord, may we find our identity in you and not in our husband or our wife, not in our singleness, Lord, but may we find our identity, all of us, in you. Help us to submit ourselves one to another. Lord, to defer to the other's preferences. Oh God, I pray that you would kill in us that, that desire that seems like a need to be right. Lord, I pray that you'd help us get your picture of how marriage is ordered. And how that is a picture, Lord, of how we are to relate to you. We thank you for it. We bless you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.